Uh, so we've been, we're wrapping up, we're closing down, we've been talking about the supernatural, we talked about the demons, we talked about possession, we talked about exorcism, we, I mean all these things are in the Bible, but we just don't talk about it. We talked about evil, and um, the evil things in the, in the world that we have to deal with, and, and uh, sometimes it leaves us with lots of questions. There's, but I, I'm just going to come out and stop camping on it for a minute, but I just want to come out and say it, that unless I see it. I will not believe it. That's kind of the whole mindset of the whole supernatural concept. That a lot of folks do not dabble in the Bible or believe in God or let these things get in their way because they worry about the supernatural. The supernatural because I can't explain it. I know it's so simple when you really think about it. but And I know not everybody comes from this environment. I felt confident in the visual that I used this morning with the, the kids that we have in this room. But they don't have to question or think that their mom and dad go to feed us tonight. There's not a fear uh, if mom and dad aren't going to come up and when I cry or I scream. Or, and, and I know that even though some of us come from rough areas and, and not everybody has the same faith experience, the same family experience, but if you can get past your worldly experiences and believe that God is your father, he is your parent, that he will provide, he will be there. What you are experiencing is what he wants you to experience. But too many of us are stuck here. Unless I see it, I will not believe it. And so a lot of times we go into the Bible and we'll read the, and, and how is it that everybody that does it that is not a Bible scholar, anybody that does not know the Bible, but they know the crazy ones. They know like the crazy verses. They know that this guy got eaten by a big whale or fish or whatever. And everybody knows that one. And then, then they'll bring up like, like this. Everybody knows Jesus. Like even if you're not a Christian, you know who Jesus is. And you know that he rose from the dead. And right there, I can't believe that. Because I've never seen anybody rise from the dead. Never seen that happen. Can't happen. It's not possible. So right there, I can't believe in what this this faith thing that you all have going on this religion. So I'm just not going to believe it because I've never seen it. So it doesn't it, it doesn't exist. Um, there's some other things like um, the Goliath thing. Like I've never seen a giant, but you know. So there's no. It's, it's, you see what I'm saying? Christians, non Christians, know some of the stories of, in our in our in our Bible and, and, and life experiences in our Bible. But because it's something that they have not seen, they cannot believe it. And, I, and we spent like that first day, that first day talking about evil. And I really enjoyed that conversation because I don't think it happens enough. Um, we avoid talking about it. We avoid talking about the bad things. We avoid, uh, and a lot of times we try to explain things. We try to explain the, the, the things we don't understand. It's a lot of times evil leaves us into this conversation of well, who's in control. Like, uh, it, does God allow it? Does that make you feel better if God allows evil to happen? Uh, can God not stop it? Does that make you feel even worse about who God is? Um, and sometimes uh, we just don't understand it, so we just disregard it completely or live in a fantasy world that we just pretend that whatever's going over there is not really existent. Um, and, and, and we just refuse to listen. And sometimes what I'm thinking is, that is a denial of the curse. I mean, honestly, we, we laid that seed that evil is a consequence of the curse that has been laid on to us. It's another one of those things that we have to deal with. The enemy, we, we discussed that the enemy is very real. And it's Satan and his minions, I mean, he has a name. I mean, he's got many names. Uh, and, and they are all very descriptive, uh, descriptive of his character. The, the deceiver, the liar, the, the manipulator. The, the, I mean, the, my favorite one is the enemy. Because he is the enemy. Every day that we get up, we are fighting a battle. Uh, you know, not only against our flesh, but against him and, and his minions and his manipulations and his lies and his deceit. Uh, the acts and actions are just, you know, it's, when you think of Satan as the person. You ever met somebody that just says those people are inherently bad and, and you just do bad things. There's nobody that pushes you, guides you, tells you, manipulates you, forces you, pushes you. And, and, and to some extent, there, that there is some truth in that. But the acts and actions are just man's doing. There's no evil involvement. And I think that that is underselling what the enemy is willing to do to us. And it's fully in Scripture what the enemy will do. You remember the man that was that Jesus healed? The, 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 the prior uh, synopsis to that meeting that Jesus had with him was that that he beat people that came up and approached him. I mean, he was overtaken with the enemy that was within him, and he would just fight and beat and, and, and hurt people. And Jesus was able to, to heal him. You know, but 
because I've never seen an exorcism, I don't want to see one. Uh, saw the movie, I'll never see it again. Um, I've never seen like physical healing. I'm sure some of us had, but some of us don't believe it. Or we'll explain it away. That this miraculous healing that just happened will explain it that something happened. And you know, and you know, I don't know, I can't explain it, but it's definitely not God's hand. We, we've seen those experiences where people try to deny that. Um, seen restoring, you know, I've never seen the restoring of life, life from being death to life. I've never seen that, so I don't understand it. And that's where we get that. Because I haven't seen it, it must not be real. It just must not be real. It must not be possible. It's not probable. It, it can't happen. And one of my favorite, and, I, and, I, and, I, and the only way I'm throwing this up is because I found myself repeating some things, but Andy Stanley's, uh, um, um, what am I thinking of? Starting point. It's one of my favorite learning tools, and I've repeatedly listened to it. I have a copy here. I have a copy of my cruiser. I have a copy of my personal car. Um, I just love listening to it. And the one that he talks about, you know, uh, about the Bible and the, and the validity of the Bible, talks about this very fact that things that we're fighting. And basically, if you put the Bible on trial, then it is probable that everything in here happened. Ha and that's what you mean is probably even if it's probable because if once you line up all the facts, things start lining together and not just the Bible, but outside sources. And there's so much you could go into if you are one of those truth and fact seekers, which I am, but it also leads into problems because then it, we all run into those roadblocks where we just struggle with it. I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't have that very struggle with the kingdom comes to evil because we've all had that moment where we said, God, why would you allow that disaster to happen? Why, why is it good that those children were hurt? And I can't explain that away. I can't. The very issue that's going to keep uh, bothering us that is it, it, those questions. And the thing is, if you continue to allow those things to rock and rattle your world, it is going to keep you from your natural destination. So you're not meant for this. And that's the only thing I can tell you if, if we've gone through this series uh, talking about some crazy supernatural things is I need to need you to understand and I want you to understand that you were this is not your natural destination. You were not meant for this. You were meant for paradise. That's what we were created for. We were meant for paradise. That is that yearning that is inside our hearts. Whether you are a believer or not, that is that searching feeling, that void that is in your heart is what you were made for, your natural destination. This earth is not your natural destination. This is, I heard Michael Keaton, I was listening to something, I guess he did an interview a long time ago. It's amazing how God shows you things just to kind of make things relevant. Um, and Michael Keaton, I guess, bought a ranch. I don't know where it is, um, but he's got, obviously he's got money. I mean, there's things that money can buy. And I guess he bought like a whole bunch of land and owns a big piece of property in like Montana. It's beautiful. And in his actual interview, and he doesn't talk about God or anything like that, but he just looks right at the reporter and says, because they're like, you know, is this like the investment you made? And, you know, wait, this is, I'm just borrowing. No, it's not mine. You know, I'm just here. You know, and I just had the opportunity to share a part of this. And I'm like, that is, if you've really thought about your life as that, if this is just borrowed time, that this is not what you're, you know, you are not living for what you can have tomorrow. You're living for what you can have in the future, forever. This is all going to go away. Now, for many pastors, Pastor Mike says, on time you can't take a hearse. The hearse doesn't have a trailer behind you. I mean, and it's so true, but many of us live that way. Like, we hold on to those things because those are things that we can obtain. Those are things that we can hold on to. Those are things that we can see. We can see our success. We can see our spreadsheets. We can see our bank accounts. We can see our homes. We can see our success in our kids. But you can't see the seeds that you planted with the things that God has given. And a lot of the things that we can't see is, is what keeps us from believing, what keeps us from stepping across that threshold. We can't see what focus ministry may become. So it keeps some of us hesitant, keeps some of us boxed in. We can't see what our kids may become. Some of us can't accept what our children may become. Then maybe it's not us that will do something great, but maybe it's a seed in one of those crazy kids downstairs that will from that will turn into a, a, a missionary for God and do something amazing. But it all starts with things that we can't see. But I won't believe because I can't see. Right? That's where that's where I remember Thomas. 
We, we left off last week talking about tongues. Talked about bringing life back to, you know, uh, from you know, our death to life, right? And, and Lazarus, we left off with the story of Lazarus, of Jesus' good friend, and Martha and Mary, his sisters, and, and Jesus, uh, they came and said that Lazarus is sick and Lazarus is dead. And Jesus, you know, well, at first they said, Gee, Lazarus is sick. And Jesus said, wait, I'll come later. And he waits two more days. And then Lazarus falls asleep. And Lazarus, he tells his disciples that he fell asleep. And then they were so, they were like us. They were like, they didn't quite catch on to what Jesus was saying. And finally, had to like break it down into sign language and write it down and play Pictionary. So they got it and said, listen, he's dead, guys. And then, then like, Latin, Thomas, uh, Jesus finally decides to go back. And Thomas ends up being like the brave one. Like, because all the other disciples were like, listen, Jesus, you can't go back there. They'll kill you. They'll hurt you. They'll hurt you. Because like, we're afraid to die. But we're afraid to die. Although death is a natural progression of our life, although it's supernatural because it's not what we were meant for. We weren't meant to die. It's not what we were meant. That's what God didn't create us to kill us. That's a hard thing to accept because we all die. We know that we die. We know every day that we're losing time, every minute, every hour. Uh, we feel every break and every bone and every fall and every hurt. Sorry, I love you, honey. You know, we feel all those things. Oh, I've got a little bit here. But we, got, we feel those things, but that's not what we were meant for. Our Father did not desire that for us. And, but So we have this natural fear of death now because it's unknown in our hearts, and it, it, it's hard to deal with, and it, it, it hurts. And Jesus here is now saying, listen, fellas, we're going to go back. And, and now they're like, well, Jesus, they, those people threatened you. They might stone you. And, and Thomas, for those that are Bible, Bible scholars, will obviously we're going to talk about Thomas and his belief and where he is. And I think many of us have a lot of Thomas in us. That Thomas is the one that steps up in front of the hole and he says, we'll go back with you. As a matter of fact, he says, he, we will go back with you. That he says he wants to go back with you. And that not only does he say, we'll go back with you, but he says, I'll die with you. We'll die with you. See, there's a point that some of us, a lot of us, say that. We say that in the comfort of our churches. We say that in the comfort of like-minded people. We, but, but, but when we're not with those like-minded people, or when tragedy strikes us, or when fear is at the door, or the enemy is lurking over our shoulder, or things aren't working out the way that we think they should, that we fall. And we deny, and we lie, and we run, and we take cover, or we, we don't stand up for what we know is right and what we believe. And Thomas is just that person. Thomas, in this moment, with Jesus in front of him, is like, you know what? I'm going with him. I'll go with him. He's right here. I can touch him. I can see him. I can smell him. I believe in him. I want to go with him. And whatever happens, I believe Thomas believed that Whatever happened, Jesus is God. Because remember, they're believing that He's the He is the Messiah. They're on that train right now, and they believe that there. Are, there I believe there's still some mixed conflict within the disciples of what's going to actually happen. Like they, you know, eventually Jesus is just doing this walking and ministry thing, but eventually the kingdom is coming down, and we're going to be in a special place with Him, and it's going to be awesome, and He's going to overthrow the Roman Empire, and things are going to be amazing. They didn't realize that Jesus came as. You know, obviously they didn't read the book of Isaiah very well, but they didn't realize that, you know, he is going to have to pay an awful price for them and for us. And so at this moment, Thomas is like, yes, I'm in. But then Thomas has some issues. Thomas comes into issues and what unfortunately makes him famous for. That's why I'm glad that we see that previous scriptures of how Thomas is supportive of Jesus. But we quickly see what Thomas is actually known for. Now we found this in John 20. Uh, now Thomas... One of the twelve was not with the disciples. See, Jesus has already passed. Jesus has died. Jesus has been crucified. Uh, Jesus has uh, been put in the grave. And Jesus has now risen from the grave. But Thomas missed it. I, I don't know what Thomas was doing. I don't know if he was out to brunch or lunch or just took a trip. Or he, we can naturally believe that possibly he was hiding. He was in hiding. Remember, the disciples are on the run. Peter denied knowing Jesus. I mean, they were scared to death. They were scared to die. Listen, they killed our teacher. I don't want to die. So they, they, they. Thomas wasn't like standing there by the grave, you know, ready to go with Jesus. I mean, my, how things have changed when we change our environment, when we change our circumstances. 
how, you know, quickly we come to church on Sunday, but then we go back to work on Monday and we quickly forget who Jesus was and what he's been telling us and how he directs us and how he wants us to live. Because it's unnatural to live the way Jesus asked us to. It is 100% unnatural in the flesh to live the way that Jesus wants us to live, to love everybody. Come on, God, not everybody needs to be loved. Because not everybody is loved. Not every circumstance, God, uh, needs to be dealt with like you want me to, with sensitivity and love and grace. Listen, they just need the truth. They don't need any grace. They just need to know. They just need to know how deplorable and how bad they cannot drive a car. They need to know how bad of a worker they are, right? And there's moments for those of you that supervise people, like, I, they just need a dose of truth. They don't need to pick me up, God. I need to just grab a hold of them and shake them. Or be in school. Like, yeah, I love this. I love students. I love them to death. And But, man, sometimes you just want to stick a foot where the sun doesn't shine. I'm sorry. It's the only way I can say it. And sometimes when they're sitting there yelling at you and cussing and cursing and the way they talk to each other, and you're just like, oh, my gosh, this generation is going to be the end of the world. But then God quickly reminds me that my parents probably said the same thing about me. And then I look at my grandparents, and I know they said that about my parents. And, you know, and, and, and it's just one of those things we all want to pass the buck. And so, but, man, how quickly when we change our circumstances or when there's a change in our environment, how quickly we forget God and the way he's directed us. Because I can't see it anymore. See, it's easy to be godly in an environment that is set for godly things. Why can't you do that at work? Why can't you set an environment at work that reminds you of who he is? Why can't you set an environment in your car to remind you of who he is? Why can't you set that environment in your home to remind you of who he is and what he calls you to be and who he wants you to be and who he's gifted you to be? I am really stuck on that. Uh, I've heard it preached many times. Pastor Stephen Furtick, the most notable that I've heard said, but the computer that speaks scripture to yourself to continuously remind yourself of who he is. Because not there's going to be times that the devil's going to blind you and you're not going to be able to see him. Or maybe you can't hear him in the moment of disparity. In your grief, in your struggle, you don't, you can't hear him, you can't see him, you can't feel him. But I need you to know that he's still there. The devil will use everything in his power. Satan and his minions will do everything in their power to keep you from experiencing or believing or feeling or knowing or seeing that he is ever present and there even in the darkest of moments because he is the light. And Thomas, in this moment, this is his darkest moment. This is Thomas. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And how great would that be? I mean, like, his natural is, I mean, we've seen the Lord. And his, it's not like, whoa, seriously? Why, you saw him? Like, he did what he said he would do? He wrote, like, these are supposed to be his buddies, his friends, his confidants. It'd be like us coming together and you all saying you saw something. But I look at you, Aaron, and be like, listen, man, are you sure? You sure you saw it? And I love it. He says, he doesn't even waste time. He doesn't mix any words. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. So I didn't put anything on that first slide that wasn't said in the Bible. Because he says it right here. I say, unless I see, I will not believe. Unless I see, I this is a man that spent three years with him. And, and had the conviction to say in a moment or of a choice for all the disciples and led the way. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't James. It wasn't John. It was Thomas that said, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go face death with him. I'll die with him. I'll go with him because I know Jesus will protect us. But now Jesus is gone and he hasn't seen Jesus for three days. And the last time he saw Jesus, Jesus was on a cross, crucified, suffering and died. That's the last time he saw him. And now he's at this moment, this crux of his, of his faith journey, of his walk, that because he hasn't, and I can't even say it, because he saw Lazarus rise from the dead. But then it makes you think, did he really just think he was sleeping and sinking? I mean, because, I mean, I'm, I'm poking fun, but Scripture tells us. I think, so that's why Scripture, it is in, in Scripture, you will find in the, 
in, in, the, in between the margins, the real grit of what God wants you. Like in that story of Lazarus, when he said, like he, they, they want you to, Scripture wants you to know, God wants you to know that, listen, he was dead because he was staying. He was, all, he was already staying. He had been dead already. You know, he's dead. But maybe, I just can only help to think that because Thomas is in doubt right now that Jesus could come back from the dead, that maybe Thomas even doubted there, even though he saw it. Do you know that sometimes we see things and we still we still try to talk ourselves out of what we saw? We see miraculous healings. We see miraculous uh, uh, provision. We see things come through. I'll never, ever, ever forget one of the greatest miracles. And, 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 and it's not a money thing to me, so please hear when I say it. But the last faith step that many of us take is when we give God our resources. Again, if you get back to that Michael Keaton thing, like you realize I'm just borrowing. It's not mine anyway. But it is still the last thing that we give. Why? Because it's something we can see. Something that we can control. At least we think we can. And I remember that for my financial guru wife, who has worked miraculous miracles within our, 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 our lives, I remember a specific Christmas where we finally were making that step. Like it's finally time to just tithe, do the normal, and do what we're supposed to do, our 10%. And we made that commitment in the year, and then it came to the Christmas offering. Like we'd always done good Christmas offerings, but now it's like, well, we committed to doing our 10% of our salary, which was a significant amount for us. And, and, and now, like, what do we do? You know, we've done all this. Do we still do big like we usually do? And I, I remember I looked at her in, in, in prayer and faith and said, you do what you think is best. Just don't. The only thing, the only God that I said was, let's just not go below what we did last year. But I think, and I believe, that we should, based off what the year we've experienced, that we should do more. And so I left, I left trusted and left it to my wife to make, to make that decision. And I still think, I'm not saying my wife's money hungry, it's just she's a control freak. And I love it, you know, because we fixed, we've come from seasons of not having enough at all. To where families bought us groceries and provided for us. And, you know, to be in a position like that is a gift from God. And I remember that... She did her thing, and it was awesome. And actually, the day that she wrote the check and put it in, she actually wanted to show me. I didn't even want to see it. I just we put it in together, and I didn't even look at it. But I remember it was like two or three days later, we got a surprise check in the mail for the exact amount that we had given in the offering for the special. And I'm like, you can't make that up. You can't, you can't pretend that that's not. And in my world, not that God needs to show himself, but that is God. That, to me, is a miracle. And it's not the miracle of putting it back in, in our accounts. That is not what I'm saying. But that is God showing her more specifically. Listen, I got this. You just need to do with what I want you to do. What I want you to do with what I give you, and I'll do the rest. Again, it's not the money, and it's not restoring the money back into our account. It's just that that reward of faithfulness. It's that same thing. If he challenges you and pushes you to step across the threshold to go mingle with somebody you normally wouldn't talk to. And maybe it's that one time that you actually went to them and you were expecting them to just be rigid and fight back and all of a sudden you got a, a tear in their eye. And they're like, man, I'm so glad you approached me today because I need to talk. It's those same moments that when you take those opportunities and it's, we struggle with it because we can't see the other side of it. We can't see that you know what it is? We're selfish. We're selfish. We want, we want the fruit before we want the work. We want the fruit on the, on the we want to see, you know, we want to see, you know, how I, I helped Lauren and we did this, and I, but I want to see what she's going to do with it. Kind of uh, talking to a friend about giving money to folks or going out and helping the homeless and and he struggled with the giving side of it because he's like, how do I know they're not going to go buy a pack of smokes? If you're buying a pack of smokes and I see that you've got a cell phone, then why do you need my money? And I'm like, well, it's not really about that, man. It's really not about that. What they do with what you give them is all them. It's what you do in the moment that God's going to remember the most. It's not about what you gave. It's, not, it, it, it's about what you did. It's about the action. It's about the step that you took. And... and like Thomas, a lot of us, you know, I, you know, I, unless I see it, unless I see the reward, unless I see the fruit, 
And I said, we're reward, we are reward driven. It's like Pavlov's dogs. Like we, we can be trained to go chase after something, you know, if we get that reward. Like we can train people you know, to do that. You and our wives are really good at training us to get rewarded. Like we, you know, hold and dangling something in front of us so that we continuously do the same thing over and over so that we get the same reward. We are all like that because we want to see the reward at the end. But God is saying, listen, I just, I need you to believe. But Thomas, right here, he struggles with it. That is us. We struggle with believing in God because we haven't seen God. We struggle with believing in God because we haven't seen somebody raised from the dead. We struggle with God because there's things in this book that we can't explain, we can't understand, we can't comprehend it. It's supernatural. And that's what causes us, we just, we just jump off the ship. You know, we have these seasons where we are on board sometimes, and then there's these seasons when we are jumping off. Like, I am off this faith train. Like, I don't want any more of this, because what he is asking of me is too much. What he's asking of us this week to possibly make a commitment and meet with somebody, it's too much, God, I can't see it, because there's only a small group of us. I don't understand it. It's, it's super, it's, you know what supernatural does? It stretches our belief. It stretches our belief. It's okay, though, because it's natural. It's natural. And God knows that about you and me, that we struggle with that. He knew that about Peter when Peter denied him. He knew Peter would do it because he already told Peter he'd do it. Peter didn't believe it because Peter was like Thomas. Like, I didn't do that. I don't know what I'll do. I'll stand beside you. But then he didn't expect to see what he saw. That's why I always stick with that mindset that the, the apostles were just like you and me. They're, they were they were afflicted. They, they, they wanted, they believed in Jesus and who he was, but they didn't believe in how he would do it. And so Peter, at that moment, you know, Peter denied it. Peter, Peter lied. This is not salt from the blow. He didn't just deny it. Lie. I'm not them. I'm not one of them. You know, he knew the disciples would hide. He knew that they would shut themselves in, that they would hide. And just because Thomas wasn't there, we know that they scattered. That they, they, were, they were not around. And he knew that Thomas wouldn't believe. He knew that Thomas wouldn't believe until he saw. But he also knew that Paul, that, that Saul, the persecutor, would be changed to Paul, the missionary. And he, there are these things that he knows there's a season for all of this. And so it kind of left me to this thought. And I actually was in my study Bible, like talking about seasons of things. But it's a natural seasons of things. There's seasons for planning. Think about it this way. The, the, the thoughts of Christ, uh, you know, the, when we think of Christ, there's the, the things that are in our minds, in our heads, and when we think about them, there's moments as us as Christians. You know, if you're not a Christian, there's something, you know, just remember when you discover God. There's something pushing. Maybe it, was a, maybe it was a friend that invited you to church and you sat there, or there was a song that you heard or a movie that you saw or a friend that invested in you. There were some thoughts that were stirring in your mind that continued to push you towards that. That's the planting. And then maybe if you're already a Christian and you know God and you believe in God, then there's that planting a seed in somebody else. It's crossing over that barrier and being the, the seed planter. Then there's the birthing, like another season, like the awakening when you finally feel God really start cracking that stone around your heart and taking out the darkness and putting it some light. There's that, that awakening, that moment. And for those of us that have already been on that walk, now it's our turn to start walking with others that have experienced that new awakening, that new uh, creation, that new birthing inside them. And then there's the, the actual growing season, the learning season, the walking, the talking, the moving on from the milk, to the actual substance and the food. Uh, for us uh, that are in this room, it's us walking with a fellow Christian on that. And this is growing, should be a continuous process for all of us. And then there's the dying season that none of us want to even talk about, which comes at a time uh, that we'll all experience. We'll all be at that experience. And then we'll all experience it again uh, together when we're being judged. And we'll either return to the covering of our Lord and Savior, back to paradise, that which we were made for, or we're going to go back and perish with the rest. I mean, it's just awful truths. And to highlight that idea of the season, you know, we go back, I'll go back all the way back to Genesis. There, uh, let there be lights in the vaults of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to, have, to give light on the earth. And so it was so. And God made two great lights. 
the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars, and God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. All on the fourth day, God created light, and light is a continuous thing that we experience in Scripture. God is light, and God is light in us. We are the light. We are a lamp. We are not meant to be colored. We are meant to shine. And wherever the light goes, darkness flees. Man, if we could just grasp that and truly understand that concept. Maybe when you're walking with your kids tonight and you're thinking of all the scary things that are out there for Halloween, think about wherever the light goes, wherever that flashlight goes, wherever that lamp goes, the light runs. I mean, start looking at darkness in a different light because darkness flees when the light enters it. Darkness can't overcome the light. There is no darkness that can cover light. Now, there may be darkness all around, but that where that light is, is going to illuminate what is around. And where there's a whole bunch of us standing, there's a brighter light. And I, and I, I bring it up because I talk about the seasons and, and, and how it's, it's natural. We fluctuate back and forth between the seasons. We're about to go into, I think fall is finally set in. Friday was a perfect football night out there in the football field. I mean, it was cold. It was a little moisture was in the air. It was rainy, and, and we got a victory. But, man, it was starting to set in fall. We turned a fire on this week, which was awesome. You know, then we'll, you know, quickly, as soon as Christmas is over, let's go back to spring, and I'll be done with the cold weather. But we fluctuate back and forth. And we're not meant to stay in one. Could you imagine if it was winter all season? I mean, maybe you're one of those people that likes that, but I don't know this, and I don't like that. It's not good for my bones. And I don't like the summer all year round. You know, I need a break from the heat at times. I need some snow. I need some, some refreshing. You know, and fall has got us, you know, fall is good, so I can smell pumpkin and have my pumpkin spice latte and, <laughs> and uh, stuff like that, right? You know, it's, I mean, it's all God, but we're not meant to stay. It's just like we're not meant to stay uh, in the planting season or the birthing season or, you know, or the growing season. Because, uh, you know, eventually, you know, I want to keep growing, but I also want to go home. There's a time in my life when I want to go home, so I want to be finished growing, you know, when God calls me home. But I want to make sure that until that day comes that I continue to grow. And so sometimes we fluctuate back and forth, or sometimes we, we stay because we don't believe, or we get stuck. We don't mature. We don't, uh, uh, you know, see fruit. See, when we were young, you knew little, but when you matured, you knew more. And I think about our little guys, and we share little scriptures with them. I mean, in their own words, I was sharing John 1 with John 1, 1 with them. But, you know, but when you think about it, when you were young, it was the simple things in life that you needed to believe. And I needed to believe that my mom would really would care for me. And you didn't have to convince me of that, that my mom would do certain things for me. You know, I didn't have to question if mom would put food in my belly. I didn't have to question if my mom's come home in life. I didn't have to question if she would come up and kiss me goodnight. I, I didn't have to question if she wouldn't hold me accountable when I screwed up. You know, uh, again, I know that that's my personal experience and that there are some of us out there that don't have those experiences, but for the most part, if you can flip that and think about that as your Heavenly Father, that He will show up when you need Him. He will be there because He was there in the beginning. This is what I said to our kids and in in, in, in talking to them, but in John 1, very powerful set of scriptures, and I think I cut and picked. No, I, I actually don't give it to give to you all. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So just in those two verses, we're planting seeds of the Trinity, and which is a whole other thing that people don't believe in and don't understand. And listen, it's like the song Warren sang today. I absolutely love it. And we are lost in the mystery. Man, this is a mystery. And I've been to school for it. And it's still a mystery. And and um, I started off in theology because I, like, I thought that that's what I needed to do. And I went in for a Master's of Divinity. If you have one, I admire you. Sometimes I wish I would have continued, but I got tired of arguing about the science of God. Like there are some things I'm just not going to know. And I'm just not going to comprehend. I'm not going to understand. And I have that mind. I know my mind that if I get... And that crossroads that sometimes maybe it will rattle my faith. I don't know. But I don't want to continue that journey. You know, so I don't want to be lost in the mystery. I want to be found in his love. 
And I, and I love that in the song. Like I want, it, it's his love that I need to understand the most. And it's his love that he sacrificed himself for us. It wasn't his explanations. It wasn't his doctrinations. It wasn't his preaching. It wasn't, you know, it, it, not necessarily his teaching is great, but it was his love. It is that ultimate sacrifice that he gave for me. I'm not minimizing the teaching of Jesus Christ or those that followed or those that came before in, in this teaching of God. But what I'm saying is that sometimes in his teaching, we get lost in the mysteries of the teaching, like the parables. There's a reason Jesus had to, to explain the parables to the disciples, because they didn't understand it. There's a reason that we get to see the parable and the explanation. You know, we get the benefit of seeing both and understanding it, reading it. But they were lost in the mystery. That's why I think Thomas was in a, in a crux of, of belief. I think that's why Peter and, and, you know, and all the disciples struggled with it, because they were still lost in the mystery. It wasn't until they saw him on the cross that they realized that his love was never ending. That his love, that because of his great love and his grace, the great grace and his mercy for us, that he had to get on that cross and he had to die for us. It is, everything else can be a mystery, but that is something that we need to understand is his love. Through, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made and that has been made. In him was light, and that light was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, by his own did not, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Not of natural descent. See, you are made for so much more. This flesh is just a wrecking. This fresh, this flesh, this fresh, this flesh <clears throat> yeah, that though is bruised and battered, poor Carrie fell this week, or uh, the, the ailments that we all suffer through, the sicknesses, the bruises, the aches, the pains, the depression, the hurt, the sadness, there will come a time where there will be a place where there are no more tears, there are no more pain, we will all be fresh, we will all be new. The, the day that we won't understand what is good and bad, we will just be in perfect relationship again. Because that is what we were made for. It's complex. Because life is complex. It's unbelievable at times. And it sometimes stops us in our tracks, but it's, it's the supernatural thing. All of it is supernatural. It is natural for us to believe in it. It's natural for us to walk, talk, laugh, lie. The list goes on, right? We didn't have, I mean, I know that we say that we teach our kids how to walk, but would they not learn on their own eventually? I mean, I literally, I can think about my kids. Like, we say we taught them, but I didn't really walk with them all the time. I mean, I, I, I maybe teased them and sat there like, come on, come on. You know, and, and they would, but eventually they, they, they got stronger. It was about the body getting stronger, and they were able to do it. I certainly never taught my child how to lie. I'm pretty good at that. I don't think they're pretty good at lying. I just think they tell uh, Asher might be a, an expert, but but you don't have to teach him to laugh. I mean, nothing. I mean, think about a child and it's in, the, in its infancy, and the, the cutest thing in the world is to hear a, a, a little baby chuckle and laugh. It's natural. You don't have to be taught to do any of those things. You, it was something that you didn't have to be given a dissertation or an explanation. You, it's just some things that we know, and that's that is what it is like to know God. Like, it's, that's the way it should be. But what's happening now in our culture is too many of us are out there talking to people out of God. Or, you know, not, not showing them the way. Some of us are doing a good job of trying to talk them into God, but in the process, we're pushing them away from God. Mm -hmm. Instead of being, you know, who God told us to be. It's natural to believe in the supernatural. It's a big old woman right there. It's what you're made for. And that's why we struggle. We struggle with the things that we don't understand, the things that we can't see. But I just, if you just go back to the book, you know, man, you were created from dirt. Just believe it. Just need you to believe it. You were created from the dirt. Reading a great book, I think I shared it with you guys last week that I, I learned something uh, 
is it called wild at heart i think but it, it's uh talking about like men were created in the wilderness you were we were even created in the garden you we were created in the wilderness that's why we're crazy that's why we're wild <laughs> i am so stuck on that thought that man was created in the dirt in the wilderness not in the garden yet but you ladies were created in the garden talking about the distinction between man and woman like men were created in the wild, and there's certain things and, and, and aspects of a man that, 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 that come with being created in the wild. And women were created in paradise. We're created in paradise. Women, you were created for this rib. Believe it. That's what it is. Well, you know, listen, I don't understand how I could. Are you telling me that Willie was created from dirt? Like <laughs> God picked up dirt? <laughs> and, and, and Adam was made? Like that, and from him came me. And, well, let's, let's, let's just be honest. Came Willie, then came, you know, I came way after Willie. You know, we struggle with that, don't we? Like, we, like Genesis is probably the most complex and crazy book, but it is the great, it's not complex. It is, Genesis is amazing. But a lot of folks will go back to the beginning, like, trying to explain it away. And you can't explain it. But I also can't believe that you can't believe you know, that, that you can't explain that that creation was created from sludge and mindless sludge and all these complex things that make us up is what we were all created from. And we can break down a notice of the school thing that I got to do and to break down creation and the many thought processes of that. I just want to believe that God did what God did and it was awesome. See, when you start believing things like this, man, this the devil's not scared of our faith. That only honors God on the good days. Or when we understand God. But when we honor God every day in all things. I was listening to Pastor Levi Lusko hint on that. And, 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 and the portion that I, I took from him is the first part. The devil's not scared of a faith that only honors God on the good days. That is true. And then I added on the other side that it doesn't just honor a faith that understands God all the time. There are things that I'm not ever going to understand or know. In my human side, in my flesh side, do I believe the murderer deserves to be in paradise with God, with the same people whose lives that he took? As a pastor, I want to tell you yes. But as a human being, I want to say, no, he doesn't. Where's his consequence? He doesn't deserve that grace. Right? And that, like, that is all of us. We don't understand or comprehend how great God is and what he can do with that. Or how God can compare my sin to that guy's sin. But that's what he does. Because he says we're all sinners. We're all screwed up. We're all broken. We're all destroyed. And so I challenge you as we close that it's natural to believe in the supernatural. And that's why when you think of the whole series, if you've seen it, thrown up there online, that supernatural is typically one full word, but super hyphen natural. It is supernatural. You've got to get to a point in your life where you can, it is, like you are super about believing in, in, in the supernatural. Like it is supernatural to believe that God can raise anybody from the dead, that God can restore, that God can heal, that God can provide, that God can do, that God can forgive you and mend anything. Because God can and God will when he desires to do it. It's on his time, not our time. And that's our struggle. And I don't want us to be stuck in a phase like Thomas, where it took Thomas, where he actually had to see. Uh, and it didn't just happen. Thomas says, unless I see, I won't believe. A week later, his disciples were in a house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Finally, the crew's all back together. Through the door, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. I love how there's an explanation point on there. It's like, like, I can just picture that the doors are locked. Jesus, all of a sudden, Jesus just shows up. Hey, peace be with you. Like, hey, whoa, Jesus, I'm going to need you not to sneak up on us like that. Uh, it's just, it's, I, get, I get a tickle out of sometimes the exclamation points that are put in Scripture. And I, and I think we need to make a big deal of that. And then he said to Thomas, he didn't wait for Thomas to come to him. Because Jesus already knew. He's not waiting for you to surrender your doubt. He's not waiting for you to finally find a, uh, an epiphany or an understanding or completely be able to understand everything. He, he already knows the things that you're struggling with. He already knows what you don't believe. 
He already knows that you really struggle with the Jonah story or, or circling around a, a wall seven times and it crumbled. He knows that you struggle with this young guy, David, killing Goliath. He knows that you struggle with him rising from the dead. He knows that you struggle with Paul being converted. You know that you struggle with him healing and exercising demons. He knows that you struggle with that unbelief, just as he knew Thomas wouldn't believe until he saw him. And so he doesn't wait for Thomas to approach him, just as he doesn't wait for you. Like he's sitting there waiting for you just to turn and look at him. Because he's standing there. He's waiting to sit at your table and have a meal with you and listen to you and have an intimate conversation. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God, my last nation for you. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, there is power when you believe in the unseen. Because none of us have the ability to see or know Jesus personally in, the, in our minds the way that we have our relationship now. It's a different type of intimacy. But he says, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. You want some amazing things to be happening in your life? You want some things to be radically changed in your life? Then you need to start believing in the things that you haven't seen. Start believing that God will show up and do the in crazy, incredible, and awesome things. Because that's what he can do, and that's what he will do. Stop getting lost in the mystery and start getting found in his love. Thomas, for the rest of his life, for the rest of our lives, is always known as Doubting Thomas. Because of this one moment where he refused to believe in what he couldn't see. And even here, Jesus somewhat gives him a little slap on the hand. Like, hey, you're one of my dudes. But you only believed when you got to see me and touch me. Blessed are those who believed and didn't see. And that's, I find that that's a powerful statement to each and every one of us. Because we didn't get the privilege to walk with Jesus. Although I think that privilege would have been a challenge. We get the privilege of believing in what we can't see. Because that truly is faith. And that's believing in the supernatural. That's believing in an amazing God that can do amazing things, even though you can't physically touch him or see him. But it doesn't minimize what he can or will do. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your, your words, your scriptures. Thank you for those that came before us, Father. God, I'm just so thankful that you continually remind us of your power, your greatness, your amazingness, your love for us. Though there are lots of things that I don't understand, that, that there are mysteries that I just can't explain. There are admittedly things that I, that I, that I get frustrated with, Father, as I try to, to break down the complexities of what it is or what you want me to see, Father. But if I can just stop getting lost there, if I can stop letting that be a wall, Father, and I can just believe that you love me. I mean, that is such a simple thing to just believe that you love me. And, and despite what I've done or where I've come from or the things that I will do, that you still love me. And Father, I pray for a faith in this room that will believe in the things that we can't see. We don't know what you will do with us individually. We don't know what you will do with our families. We don't know uh, what will come of focus. We don't know what will come of this community. We don't know what will come of this country, this world, Father. Only you know. But Father, we choose to put our faith in you. And we choose to take steps in that which we can't see. Because we know that you have our best interests. Even in the valley, Father, we will rely on you more. Like Elisha and his servant, Father, we will look around those that surround us and call us uh, deceivers, that call us liars, that call us uh, names and pick at us for what we believe in, Father. We will believe that those that are for us are more than those that are against us, Father. That your army is, a, is built to overcome the enemy. The enemy has already lost. It has already been said. It has already been predestined, Father. And that our place in your book and our place in your home has already been picked. We have a room with our name on it. We have a bed where we will sleep. Father, you have chosen that for us. That this is not the world that we were created for. We were created for your paradise. 
Father, I pray that that, that that is opened up in our minds right now, that we can understand that this is not what we were meant for. We were meant for the supernatural. We were meant for the future. We were meant for what you have in store for us, not what we endure here. So, Father God, I pray for people in this room right now that are ready to take that journey, that are ready to take those steps, Father. Empower us, encourage us, help us to see and hear and do the things that you have asked us to do. To not believe in what we will get from it, not to believe in what we can only see, but to believe that you will do the best with what we do. Because it's not dependent on me, it's dependent on you. Father, we thank you for this moment. We pray for our kids this evening as they go out and have fun. We pray for the safety of our neighborhoods, and we pray for the safety of our, of our families. Father, we pray for your blessing over this community. We pray for your healing touch. We pray for your grace to run through our hearts. And Father, to help us to be the hands and feet of your ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.